Hello and welcome to this presentation about the Celtic star law of the Pendragon law of the Arthurian romances, simplistically the dragon law of Merlin. To begin, we need to look at the dragon in the night sky in the centre of the stars. Here is the centre of the night sky of the northern hemisphere. The circle has the dragon in the middle. Draco is Latin for dragon, and it is the main constellation in the middle of the night sky. Around the circle are other circumpolar constellations. They're the ones that are always there. They never come and go like the seasonal stars. And because planet Earth does a slow wobble with its axis, it marks a circle rather than a single point. So if you look at the bottom of this picture, you can see the constellation Ursa Major, the Great Bear. And then coming up to the circle, it says 5000 BC. So that was the middle of the night sky in the year 5000 BC. There's no star there, but that was the center point around which all the other stars appeared to rotate because that's where the axis of planet Earth was pointing. When we come around to the right, you'll see there's a star called Thuban, which is part of the dragon. So in the Bronze Age, the, that star of the dragon was at the center point, the pole star on the dragon's tail. Carrying on around, you'll come to 1 AD, artificial date, but carrying on up, you come to Polaris about three o'clock. And Polaris is the pole star at this moment in time. Right now, Polaris appears to be the pole star around which all the other stars are rotating. And we can carry on around, you know, by the time you get to almost midnight, it's about 8,000 AD. It's mad, isn't it? 6,000 years from now. It takes a long time for the pole stars to change. And then eventually it will be on the left wing of Cygnus the Swan. Arching over the top of this picture is the Milky Way. Cassiopeia to the right hand corner and Cygnus the Swan to the left. So over thousands and thousands of years the pole stars change but the circle that they form inside that circle is Draco the dragon. Draco the dragon was always and will always be at the center of the pole stars Here's a traditional image of Draco on the right hand side and underneath his belly is the little bear, Polaris, Ursa Minor. Polaris is on the little bear's tail. And the star map on the left shows the whole of the Milky Way from the Northern Hemisphere perspective with the winter stars, the winter hexagon at the bottom and the summer stars, the summer triangle at the top. Between them on the Milky Way is the W-shaped constellation of Cassiopeia, the Queen of Heaven, Danu, Chlistone. I've already done a video called The Great Mother Goddess of the Celts. You can find that on this YouTube channel. So the W-shape, the Queen of Heaven on the Milky Way. To the left are the circumpolar stars, the pole stars. 
Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, and Draco the dragon. So Ursa Major, as we've discussed, can be seen as the ladle of the goddess's cauldron, as she's stirring her cauldron. But equally, the dragon has always been her companion. The dragon is always there. So the dragon is the pole star center of the night sky. The queen of heaven is on the center of the Milky Way. It's not quite the center of the night sky, but they're both ever present. They're both there all year round. So again, here's another detail of it. This is a map I've taken from the internet. So it says Big Dipper for Ursa Major. But going round to Cygnus the Swan, the pole star in the swan's wing will be the North Pole Star in 10,000 AD. Mad how far away in time that is. And eventually it will come all the way around back to Thuban and Draco again. But what I want to draw your attention to is inside the circle of the pole stars, the dragon is actually curving around what's called the North Ecliptic Pole, which isn't a star, it's just the center point of this pole star circle, but it's an imaginary pole. <clears throat> and the serpent or dragon around the pole has been a meaningful symbol since the earliest times, since the Bronze Age, at least, you know, in the Bronze Age, Draco was around the pole axis point. So you literally can imagine it as a pole pointing to the center of the stars, connecting earth and heaven. And at the top is the serpent or dragon on the pole. And this is a very old image. And I'll give you some examples. So you'll find it in books of alchemy and magical treatises and stuff. And in the Old Testament, there's a scene in the story of Moses where he puts the brazen serpent on a big pole to protect the people of Israel from fiery serpents. There's old star law, really. Moses is the latter part of the Bronze Age, and so it, that's the center of the night sky in that era. It has long been seen as a symbol of protection, as a symbol of healing. So Moses uses it to protect the Israelites. In ancient Greece, the single serpent on the pole is the symbol of the god of healing called Asclepius. The wand or staff of Asclepius has a single serpent upon it. It's different to the wand of Mercury, which has two serpents. But the single serpent on the pole is Draco at the center of the night sky and a symbol of healing. Famously, it belongs to the mythology of the 12 labors of Hercules, which is star law, and the serpent or dragon on the pole or a tree. In the stories of Hercules, this is the great serpent or dragon called Ladon, and Ladon protects the golden apples of the Hesperides, the mythical otherworld realm by Avalon, place of apples. In Greek mythology, these were the golden apples protected by the Hesperides, and it was Ladon, the serpent, that protected the tree. This tree with golden apples and a serpent, of course, is exactly the same as the biblical story. This wonderful carving is from Notre Dame in France, and it shows Eve eating a forbidden apple from the tree of life. And you can see the serpent rising up the tree of life, who at Notre Dame is a female with breasts. 
very close to the breast-shaped constellation of Cassiopeia, circumpolar stars. But the tree, the pole, the apples, the serpent is old law going way, way back. And the apples were always about healing, regardless of what the Garden of Eden story condemns Adam and Eve for their sin. You know, apples are life. Apples are Avalon, the golden Hesperides. So in the Well Maidens of the Summerlands artwork that I've done, one image of Merlin, I have shown his staff. And on the left-hand side, you can see I've put the constellation of Draco around his staff. So all wizard staffs and druid staffs can be placed in the ground as a pole axis to the spirit world, the star realm, at the top of which, even though we're now pole star, the little bear, the whole central pole star area is Draco, the dragon. And those ideas of serpent energy or dragon energy connecting heaven and earth, rising up the pole, we are going to look at now. But first, before we go into the Merlin law of the Pendragon, we need to look at the Roman British law of the dragon. And you'll see here on the right that the Roman cavalry had the dragon's head on a pole. It was the standard, the banner of the cavalry, the knights, the knights on horses of the Roman Empire. Arthur. Merlin, Taliesin, they were all descendants of Roman Britain, so Romano-Celtic. So let's have a look at Roman dragon law. The Roman army was steep in zodiac symbolism, representing the heavens, blessing them, no doubt. Every single Roman legion had a golden eagle as their main standard. It was called an aquila. An aquila is the constellation of the eagle. It's also a symbol of Jupiter, the god of the chief god of the Romans and the thunderbolts, lightning bolts were Jupiter's thunderbolts. All the shields of the Roman legionaries depicted the golden wings of the golden eagle of the constellation Aquila. Along with the thunderbolts, you can see on the shield designs, quite standard. It's just giving this as an example of how for their symbols, and heraldry, shields and standards, they used the heavens, the constellations. Even this little sea goat, when Britain was conquered by the Roman Empire, there were four legions that came here, thousands and thousands of soldiers. One of them was called the Second Legion Augustus, and they conquered the south of Britain. Counties like um, Dorset and Devon and Somerset and even Gloucestershire. One by one, the Second Legion Augusta conquered hillfort after hillfort, defeating Celtic tribal people. They set up their first base at what became Exeter and then gradually worked up and created what became Gloucester. Their symbol, the second legion Augusta, was Capricorn, Capricorn the sea goat, the zodiac sign of the winter solstice. And again, it's just another example of Roman symbolism actually being constellations in the night sky. And so that takes us back to Draco, of course. So the Roman cavalry used Draco. 
and the, the individual horse rider that carried the Draco, the dragon, was called the Draconarius. And it was their job, and they would ride around the battlefield giving signals by waving their dragon. And all the other horse riders would know which way to turn left or right, whatever, you know. So it was a way of communicating for the cavalry. This becomes very important with the idea of King Arthur and his knights because his inherited cavalry systems, methodologies, uh, and their main flag being the dragon, you know, the dragon's head. Here's a close-up of a real one. So this was found in Germany somewhere, but it, it's a Roman Draco from a Roman cavalry unit. So the foot soldiers, the legionaries, had the eagle, the golden eagle, and the cavalry had the dragon. As well-established law from the Roman Empire. Here's a thing from, uh, it was found in southern Gaul, Romano-Celtic Gaul, I think around about the third century. It's called the Bianchini Tablet, and I think it's kept in the Louvre Museum in France. It's a smashed up kind of plaque and lots of the pieces are missing. I think it was found down a well. So someone had thrown it down a well and it got broken into pieces. But there was enough pieces to attempt reassembling to figure out that it was concentric circles of the zodiac and the night sky. And the center point, there's a drawing here on the right hand side, is Draco and the two bears, the little bear and the mother bear. So that was, it's like a perfect yin and yang symbol from China, which has the same night sky, of course. Um, but it's a stylized way of drawing the two bears and the dragon at the center of the night sky. But you can see how the dragon isn't like a Welsh dragon on the Welsh flag. It, it's more like a serpent, or it's more like the dragon on the battlefield carried by the Roman cavalry. It's this long serpent with its tail flowing in the wind. On the left is the how the stars actually look. Uh, but you can see on the right-hand side that even up until Renaissance times, the same sort of stylized S curving with the two bears is continued right up until modern day, really. Although the stars themselves aren't so stylized, but on the left, you can see how they actually are. The little bear kind of inside the serpent, the serpent snakes around the little bear. So, um, you know, the Britons battered by the Romans and um, over a number of centuries, they gradually became Romanized. You know, they were still Celtic Britons, but they were hybrid. They were Celtic and they were Roman. They spoke Latin, but they still worshipped their Celtic gods and goddesses, even though they weren't allowed to have druids. There's still plenty of evidence of Celtic deities in so-called Roman Britain. You know, uh, this is a lovely mosaic from South Wales. It's on the River Severn, a place called Lydney. Lydney was a healing temple sanctuary. Um, but here you have two stylized sea monsters, but the kind of sea serpent, sea dragons with their necks entwined. Um, behind them are two dolphins. So they're like two Loch Ness monsters with their necks entwined. But with the Roman dragon law, it's primarily the one dragon on the pole. And when we start getting into Celtic mythology, the emphasis is on two dragons. So it's more like the double serpent of the Mercury staff, the Caduceus. So a famous Roman, British, Romano-Celtic icon is this wonderful face from Bath. Um, which is a variant of Lou or Lugus, 
but you can see how uh, in the lower area there's two serpents, you know, up above his ears are two wings. So the the wings and the twisted serpents is very mercury, mercurial. So it suggests Lugus or a version of Lugus as a kind of mercurial sun god. So with that said, we can now leave the nasty Romans behind and look at some of the more interesting Brythonic, Celtic, Welsh dragon lore that leads us into Merlin. Now, before we come to the dragon lore of Merlin, there is a prequel that we need to look at. And this is an old story that's kept in the compilation known as the Mabinogion. And this is the story of Chlith and Hlefelis, who are two brothers. And Chlith is a version of Lu, Lugus, um, Chly. He's the mercurial uh, deity, if you like. He's a son of Belimor. Bellymore or Belly the Great is like an old father god of the British pantheon, a bit like the Dagda in um, Ireland. So Chlith is like a son of the good god, Belly. The story that is told then is that when his father dies, Belly Moore, his son, Chlith, inherits the island of Britain. This is the story as remembered by Welsh bards. Trouble is, his kingdom is plagued by three plagues. And it's a bit of a complicated story, so I'm only going to talk about one of the three plagues. Now, one of the three plagues, the second of the three, is that every Beltane, every Mayig, or every Beltane, Beltane, there is a huge monstrous scream that goes across the land. And I'm going to read it. This is the translation from the Lady Charlotte Guest version of the Mabinogion. But this is the description of the second plague. The second plague was a shriek which came on every May Eve, Beltane. Over every hearth in the island of Britain, and this went through people's hearts and scared them so much that the men lost their hue and their strength, and the women lost their children. And the young men and the maidens lost their senses. And all the animals and the trees and the earth and the waters were left barren. So there's this monstrous scream every Beltane, every May Eve, that makes the whole kingdom a wasteland and sends people into madness. So Chlith goes to his brother, Chlefelis, who has inherited what we now call Brittany. So he crosses the English Channel and asks his brother for advice, what to do about these three plagues and what are they? So I'm cutting a long story short, but you can read this for yourself in Lady Charlotte Guest's translation of the Mabinogion. But his brother explains to him what the screaming shriek is every bell tape. The second plague, said he, that is in thy dominion. Behold, it is a dragon and another dragon of a foreign race is fighting with it and striving to overcome it. And therefore does your dragon make a fearful outcry. So. Taking from that then is that Chlith has his own dragon. 
and a foreign race has a dragon. And the two dragons battle every Beltane, every May Eve. Something to think about there. So it's two warring armies, two kingdoms, each with a dragon at the front of its army. You know, the dragons begin to represent two fighting forces. Anyway, Cleith's brother explains to him what he needs to do and he has to figure out the center of his kingdom it's very interesting because draco the constellation of the dragon is the center of the night sky you know so cleith has to find the center of his kingdom and by trickery bring the dragons down into the center of his kingdom where he has dug a trap for them and he makes them drunk on mead, you know? And uh, so eventually the story unfolds and he does manage to trap the two dragons. And then once they're drunk, he has to bury them so that they can no longer terrorize the land every Beltane, every May Eve. So, um, he takes them from the center of his kingdom to what we now call the mountain of Dinas Emrys in Wales, in Snowdonia. And there he buries them, buries them good and deep to protect the land. Now, when we get to the first adventures of Merlin, these dragons are released and it's a catastrophe but we'll come back to that when we get there. So interesting, though, is that two dragons battling every Beltane is akin to the folklore of Glastonbury, where the Winter King, Gwynap Neath, and the Summer King, Gwythir at Greedle, have a battle every Beltane. And curiously, it is intimately connected with Hlith, the god, the mercurial god who buried the dragons, because the Winter King and the Summer King are fighting for the daughter of Leith. So there's a direct connection that there's these two warring armies, each would have a, ba a dragon banner at the front of their armies because it's dark ages it's inherited romano-celtic fighting system styles before we move on there's a suggestion then of a kind of rudimentary uh brythonic cosmology if you like that the great god belly moor is a kind of sun god it means the great shining one belly moor so you can see that as the sun, and his sun is Hlith. So it's the Celtic Mercury, you know, son of Bellymore. And coming closer to planet Earth, first there's the sun, then there's Mercury, then there's the planet Venus, the goddess of love. And in the Welsh traditions of Gwynap Neath, Hlith is Crydilath. And Crydilath is the beautiful flower maiden, spring goddess that the Winter King and Summer King are fighting for every Beltane. So then that looks like you've got the Sun, Mercury and Venus, and then you come to planet Earth. And on planet Earth, it's duality, it's night and day, it's hot and cold, it's winter and summer. And that's personified by two, fat, two dragons fighting each other. It's very interesting. Again, it's just a pattern, but it but it looks like a, a echo of some sort of cosmology. So now that we've seen the red, the, the two dragons that have been buried, we can go to the story of Merlin and his childhood. The dragon as a battle banner for the front of cavalry, mounted forces, knights in armour, 
continued in Europe and Britain well into the 12th century. Here it's depicted on the Bayeux Tapestry, which is an illustration of the Norman invasion of Britain, Battle of Hastings, 1066, and all of that. But the Draco was still being used in 1066 and afterwards, you know, the, the fighting methods of mounted warfare didn't change much and symbolism gets continued from century to century. The dragon stayed as the main banner for mounted warfare. So when we come to Merlin, nothing was really written down until the 12th century, so after the Battle of Hastings. So the dragon law we can prove of the Bayeux Tapestry continued into the 12th century. And then in the 12th century, this gentleman, Geoffrey of Monmouth, wrote his stories about Merlin. And it's from his stories that we have all of the Merlin law. It begins with Geoffrey of Monmouth. Hypothetically, you can speculate that it existed beforehand, but we can't prove it. And we don't know how much is his invention and how much is him recording for prosperity, folklore or oral tradition. We have no way of knowing. But from Geoffrey of Monmouth onwards, we have our first written evidence for Merlin and the dragon law. Now, he begins with Merlin's childhood and tells how the two dragons that were buried at Dinas Emrys by Hlith in the story previously mentioned are revealed, are released, are set free. And it's a big catastrophe. There is a bad king called Vortigern and Vortigern is trying to build a castle and the castle won't stand. The foundations keep falling apart and his soothsayers tell him that you must sacrifice a young boy that doesn't have a father. Anyway, they scour the land and they find Merlin. Now the backstory with Merlin is that he's kind of an immaculate conception. His mother was visited by an incubus or a demon or something other, an old deity from the pagan pantheons. But Merlin is half human, half something else. So he's the boy without the father. And he's dragged to Vortigern to be sacrificed. And just before he's sacrificed, he shouts and explains to Vortigern why his castle can't be built and what's wrong with the foundations and so on. And he reveals that in the foundations is a pool with the red and the white dragons in the Hlith had buried. Anyway, cutting a long story short, um, the dragons are revealed and I'll read a little bit from Geoffrey of Monmouth. While Vortigern, king of the Britons, was still sitting on the bank of the pool, which had been drained of its water, there emerged two dragons, one white, one red. As soon as they were near enough to each other, they fought bitterly, breathing out fire as they panted. The white dragon began to have the upper hand and to force the red one back to the edge of the pool. The red dragon bewailed the fact that it was being driven out and then turned upon the white one and forced it backwards in its turn. As they struggled on in this way, the king ordered Merlin to explain just what this battle of the dragons meant. Merlin 
a child, a boy, immediately burst into tears. He went into a prophetic trance and then spoke as follows. Alas for the red dragon, for its end is near. Its cavernous dens shall be occupied by the white dragon, which stands for the Saxons, whom you have invited over. The red dragon represents the people of Britain, who will be overrun by the white one. For Britain's mountains and valleys shall be levelled, and the streams in its valleys shall run with blood. And then it goes on, the young boy gives a big prophecy. But it's from this story onwards that we have the idea that the red dragon is the Britons and the white dragon is the Saxons. And that the Britons, the red dragon, are going to lose. The land will become England, will become Saxon land, Anglo-Saxon land. So... It, before this, it was just two dragons fighting at Beltane. And the dragons fighting at Beltane are suggestive of a seasonal battle between a winter king and a summer king fighting for the daughter of Hleith, a kind of Venus spring goddess. And they were the dragons that were buried. And then when they were revealed in Merlin's childhood, their emphasis is changed to representing the dragon of the British army, the Britons, and the dragon of the Saxon army, and that the red dragon, the dragon of the Britons, is going to lose. The, the Britons will be defeated by the Saxons. So this is Merlin's prophecy, even just as a little boy. And of course, it's the origin of Idregoch, the red dragon, the, the emblem of Wales, Wales being um, the survivors of the ancient Romanized Celtic Britons, you know. So then the story unfolds. Merlin goes from being a boy to being a young man, and Vortigern is defeated, the bad king, and the new king takes his place, a king called Aurelius. Who isn't so bad and Merlin actually helps as best as he can to restore order and protect the land and he works with the brother of the king. Aurelius is the king and his brother is Uther and Uther is destined to be King Arthur's father but not yet he's just a he's just the king's brother and Merlin and Uther have a big adventure where they go off to Ireland and steal a stone circle, which they erect at Salisbury Plain, which is Stonehenge. Of course, it's, it's not true. It's just it's just 12th century story. However, it's interesting that the idea that the stones were stolen from Ireland, the part of South Wales where the blue stones come from, it was an Irish colony, you know, the, the, the lower area, Diffed and uh, Pembrokeshire and the Priscilla Mountains. Back in the Dark Ages, it was Romanized Britons and Irish living together. The stones there with Irish Oem and Latin on bilingual Oem stones. So whilst it's not true that they went all the way to Ireland and stole the stones for Stonehenge. There's a half truth of from the furthest west, the blue stones were taken from an Irish cultured area, like the coastal territories were uh, an extension of Ireland, if you like Irish sea trade, and dragged all the way to Salisbury Plain. And it was by the by, but it's curious. Before the stones were in Ireland, according to Geoffrey of Monmouth, they were in Africa. So these stones have moved around, according to Geoffrey of Monmouth, which is this illustration here. It shows Africa in the bottom left-hand corner, as well as the Celtic Sea and the stones going from Ireland to Britain. Those ideas were floating around in the 12th century. 
we must make of them what we will. Anyway, whilst the young Merlin, in his 20s maybe, is working with Uther, a strange thing happens. There is a massive meteorite or supernova that happens in the sky. And I'll read that explanation. There appeared a star of great magnitude and brilliance with a single beam shining from it. At the end of this beam was a ball of fire spread out in the shape of a dragon. From the dragon's mouth stretched forth two rays of light, one of which seemed to extend its length beyond the latitude of Gaul, while the second turned towards the Irish Sea and split up into seven smaller shafts of light. This star appeared three times, and all who saw it were struck with fear and wonder. Uther, the king's brother, who was hunting for the enemy army, was just as terrified as the others. He summoned his wise men so that they might tell him what the star portended. He ordered Merlin to be fetched with the others, for Merlin had come with the army so that the campaign could have the benefit of his advice. As he stood in the presence of his leader and was given the order to explain the significance of the star, he burst into tears, summoned up his familiar spirit and prophesied aloud. Our loss is irreparable, he said. The people of Britain are orphaned. Our most illustrious king has passed away. Aurelius has died. By his death we shall all die unless God brings us help. Hasten forward, most noble leader. Hasten forward, Uther, and do not put off for a moment making contact with the enemy. Victory shall be yours and you will be king of all Britain. The star signifies you in person. And so does the fiery dragon beneath the star. The fiery dragon beneath the star. The beam of light which stretches towards the shore of Gaul signifies your son, who has not yet been born, who will be a most powerful man. His dominion shall extend over all the kingdoms which the beam covers. The second ray signifies your daughter, who has not yet been born, whose sons and grandsons shall hold one after the other the kingship of Britain. Although he remained in some doubt whether or not what Merlin had prophesied was true, Uther nevertheless continued to advance against the enemy as he began. And then the story unfolds, Uther's victorious, Uther becomes king of Britain. And because of this strange meteorite or supernova, he acquires the name of Uther Pendragon. And the description was quite interesting because Merlin described it as the fiery dragon beneath the star. And that's played out, of course. Draco can be seen as being below Polaris, the North Star. Now that we've shifted from Bronze Age into the Dark Ages, medieval times and so on, that pole star shift looks like the dragon is beneath the star. All of that lore of Uther um, is before King Arthur is even born. So before Uther has even been crowned King of Britain, Merlin has already had the dragon law of the red and white dragons from Dinas Emrys. And there's already been the supernova dragon's head, Pendragon, that gave Uther his epithet, his surname, you know, and his son, Arthur, will be King Arthur Pendragon because of this amazing 
vision of a star in the night sky. Anyway, that's a story to be told uh, another time, you know. So, but all of that dragon lore of Merlin is before Arthur is even born. It's interesting. Um, you need to get yourself a copy of Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain to read the rest of the story of how Uther changes magically into the likeliness of Igraine's husband, Galois of Galois of Cornwall, Duke, yep. And Merl uh, Merlin has Arthur conceived and so on and so forth. The story's well familiar. Just to wrap things up, there's this icon that I drew for the goddess Brigid, who's also Saint Bride, uh, Brigantia in Northern Britain. But all of her imagery is circumpolar stars. So on her chest is the W shape of Cassiopeia, the queen of heaven. And there's the little bear. It looks like there's a bit of shiny wind coming out of his bottom, uh, but it's actually representing the pole star Polaris, which is the little bear's tail. So that's the new pole star at the moment. And the great bear is the mother bear of the cub. So you've got the big bear, the little bear, you've got the W shape of Cassiopeia, and Draco the dragon in this icon is the red serpent going up the pole or spear of Brigid Brigantia. So interesting how you can take star law motifs and weave them into artwork for iconography, so on. So if you enjoyed that, there's a lot more kind of star law stories and intrigues in my big book. Um, Gwyn, God of Anuin, Druidic Star Law, and the Bardic Mysteries. It's over 700 pages with lots of uh, intrigues like Draco in it. And if you'd like to help out, subscribe, um, leave a comment, and so on, you can visit my website. You can help by buying an art print or leaving a little donation, and that will encourage me to make more videos like this. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it.